more or less any uh, invitation to come to Media Lab Prado now, especially that they have this amazing building, um, and to the Libra Graphics Conference and to the Libra Graphics Research Unit for uh, inviting me. It's uh, a great opportunity. I used to um, do field work at conferences like this, right? I was an observer, uh, sometimes a participant, sometimes someone just coming to, to learn more. Um, and so it's very flattering to be asked to actually speak uh, in front of an audience of people um, who have provided for a lot of my um, research career um, the material on which I've tried to make sense of free software in different ways. Um, so this is, uh, as they say, um, and now for something completely different <laughs> from what we've been seeing today. Um, I want to take a position tonight on um, free software and free culture, um, open source, free software, free culture, open access, all of things that I work on, um, which is that I think it should become more parasitic. Um, and I'll try and give you a couple reasons why I think that's an interesting direction to take this. Um, one is that I think we actually misunderstand how um, central and powerful and downright awesome parasites actually are. Um, and biologists, I think, are only really beginning to, to realize this. Um, and so uh, I'm going to give you something to think with in that respect. Um, and the second is that I, I feel in some ways that we need a way for free software to save itself and free culture and open source from itself. Um, because it's my sense that it's trapped in uh, a certain kind of narrative about what it is and where it's going and what it does. Um, that might need some uh, reconfiguring. Um, I'm unfortunately not in the position where I get to stand up here and show you something I've made and ask you to help me make it better. Um, although I get that and I try to do that in my own practice as an academic and so in some ways that is what I'm doing here tonight with this talk is to try and offer something which hopefully will be provocative, uh, make you think a little and maybe allow you to um, um, to help contribute to it. Um, so I will um, start then with an idea. So it's, it's to me a kind of clear and unambiguous case um, that free software involves people implementing, expressing, and trying to spread ideas, concepts. And this relationship uh, has to somehow be built into uh, expressed in, circulated through uh, technologies. And it's this relationship that's really at the heart of my intellectual practice at this point, trying to figure out exactly how the ideas that we care about um, get embedded in the technologies we make um, and what happens to them when we do that. Um, now, this is obviously free software, uh, open source, free culture is, is not the first time humans have tried to do such a thing. Uh, but it's one way that people all over the world are doing it today and it's changing the way we'll do it in the future. Um, but I also do not think that free culture, free software, peer production, open source, et cetera, are inevitable. And um, this is particularly true from my perspective in Los Angeles, down the street from Hollywood, uh, and down the coast from Silicon Valley, um, and living amongst academics. Uh, it sometimes feels to me that the community of people who work on free software and open source and open access is increasingly marginal um, and misunderstood. Um, and it's associated for better or worse with piracy and hacking uh, on the one side and on the other with unsustainable business models and bad capitalism, both unjustly, I think. And I worry that the focus on, for instance, community and motivation and cooperation, which has taken up a lot of what people who are academics thinking about free software have focused on, might actually be unhelpful at some level. Um, I don't think that the people who care about free software or open source or free culture are a special kind of community with special ideas separate from the mainstream. Um, they are, as we know, part of the 99%, right? Um, so when I talk about parasites tonight, uh, it's because I'm in some ways trying to propose a way to think that does not separate out the community uh, and, and individualize it as something separate from, from other communities, but tries to think about integrating it without assimilating or destroying it in the process. So let's start with some parasites. So this good looking fellow on the screen here is um, Toxoplasma gondii. And Toxoplasma gondii is an amazing little microorganism. In this picture, it is dividing, which it does really, really well. It can also reproduce sexually and asexually, 
both of which it also does really, really well. Um, and T. gondii has a life cycle, as all parasites do. So here's a sketch I found that I really like of this. It's a microorganism that's found in a range of animals. Often it ends up in shit, as many parasites do. And often that shit, often cat shit, ends up in rats, as cat shit often does. And then sometimes those rats end up in cats, because cats like mice and rats. And sometimes it also ends up in humans, who eat, for instance, undercooked meat, um, and sometimes when they change, for instance, kitty litter, which is why you're sometimes told not to change the kitty litter if you're pregnant, because toxoplasma gondii can be fatal in infants. But it's often present in adults, asymptomatically, meaning it doesn't do anything. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's not fatal in adults. It might actually be here in the room with us. I don't know that for sure. But this story gets more interesting, I think, because the parasite isn't just a stowaway, right? It isn't just along for the ride in a conveniently, richly stocked larder that is a rat or a cat. T. gondii is also a hacker of sorts. Some of these bacteria, when they enter into their part of their life cycle in the rat, head off into the brains of those rats, where they cause changes in the behavior of their host. Those rats, for instance, might stop avoiding cats. Indeed, there is evidence they might actually become attracted to cat odor as a result of this infection in their brain, instead of, as they normally are, repelled by it, thus increasing the chances of being eaten by a cat. So um, this goes under the uh, label of, I'll just share, share with you, this is my show and tell here, <clears throat> host manipulation by parasites. This was a gift from my wife, who's also really interested in parasites. Uh, manipulation being the um, important part of the story here, um, because it is the um, uh, life cycle of the parasite in which uh, hosts become a kind of vehicle for uh, extending the phenotype of the, ho of the, of the parasite itself, right? In extending its ability to live in other places. So here's a 1% um, cat. We're not really clear yet on what the behavior changes in the bacterium uh, uh, might induce in cats, but this is also part of the study. And we also know that um, there's some evidence that it induces behavior changes in humans as well, humans are, who are infected. Um, and the hypotheses include everything from schizophrenia to aggressive behavior um, to um, uh, aggressive driving. There's a study on aggressive driving. <laughs> So that must be only in America, right? <laughs> um, behaviors that may or may not have something to do with the survival of this organism, or perhaps even benefits for some of those who harbor it. So this raises the question, who's parasitizing whom? Right? Now we tend to think of parasites in, in that, that language, the language of parasites always reduces them to predators, those who are feeding on others, right? Uh, literally, the word is nice. It means the, 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 the person who eats at another's table, right? So it's, a, it's about communal feasting, as it were. Um, but I'm thinking of parasites here as something which have a, a much richer um, uh, life cycle and uh, expression of their own power. And why do I tell you this story? Well, parasites like this are everywhere. And they cover the spectrum from purely predatory to miraculously mutualistic. Fig trees and wasps, bacteria that make crickets commit suicide, fish and squid who've developed light organs that have glowing bacteria inside them that allow them to see underwater and even make themselves invisible. But of course, I'm not here to give you a biology lesson. Though if I had my way, I would have proposed an interactivo session entirely on parasites and we would have spent two, two weeks on it but um, that may have tried everyone's patience. But I'm not here to give you a biology lesson. Um, it's, I like the story because as we say in anthropology, it's good to think with, because it demonstrates a kind of relation and life cycle that I think is good for thinking about our own social and collective relations. The parasite's not a freeloader, a free rider, or a leech. Such images of parasites confuse an action, feeding or predation, with a relationship dependency, manipulation, advantage or disadvantage, obligation, reciprocity, mutualism. Now, there are other reasons, I think, to like the figure of the parasite as well, and maybe some of these will come up as I talk through the rest of this. 
Um, parasites are lurkers, not predators or alpha males or lead designers. No offense to lead designers or lead coders. Uh, it's a story about superorganisms rather than individuals and collectives, which is very useful, especially for people in sociology, because we tend to tell our stories almost entirely in terms of individuals and collectives. So the idea of a superorganism is useful. It's about the life cycle, not just the free living stage. I think that when people think of parasites, they think about them primarily in their free, what, what the biologists call free living stage. That is when they're not inside another um, host. Um, this is actually a story of a life cycle um, and not a dream of escaping all relations. And it's also a story about being careful about who you associate with, right? Choosing your parasites and who you parasite. Um, is there anything else? Not yet, but there will be. Don't worry. <laughs> You're imagine everyone in here is imagining their own parasite. <laughs> and right now, in five, four, three, two... <laughs> Tonight, <laughs> I want you to think about three kinds of parasitism and their relationship to free software and free culture. Um, one of these might be familiar to many people who've probably read it, and that's a famous 1960 article by J.C.R. Licklitter called Man-Computer Symbiosis, in which he actually proposed that the kind of relationship we should have with our computers should be that of the fig tree and the wasp, the one of the most famous mutualistic parasites. The fig tree and the wasp literally cannot live with each other, live without each other. The fig produces wasps and it produces seeds. The wasp pollinates the fig and produces more wasps, right? But they have to live together. Um, and, and this approach to um, man-computer symbiosis was, was Licklitter's way of saying, uh, computers are here, we need to figure out how to live with them in this mutualistic relationship and not in the relationship that we imagine artificial intelligence to be creating, i.e., that's why Skynet is mentioned here, right? The, uh, the, the computer that will eventually replace humans, right? So it's a different approach to understanding that. But I also want you to think about um, uh, concepts that will, that will make up the bulk of what I'm gonna talk about today as parasites on technology, or maybe vice versa. How, what is this relationship between concepts and technologies? And then maybe a more specific version of this, which I'll come back to at the end, which is free software is parasitic on proprietary software, or vice versa. Now, when I talk about concepts, I mean something big, right? Not just your regular, everyday concept of dog or um, Media Lab or whatever, but these political concepts that play a very important role in um, communities like this one, in free software communities, in free culture, in um, uh, open source, open access especially. Um, and these abstract political and philosophical concepts are frequently much more troubled than these prosaic ones like cat or rat or parasite. Um, they're shared heterogeneous objects. They have a lot of literature associated with them, a lot of debate. Um, they connect up logic and experience, etc. cetera. Um, and we tend to rely on them a lot, whether or not we are philosophers or professional academics, right? Freedom being the most obvious in that. That's what I will talk about freedom and um, participation today. Um, and the good thing about them, though, is that if you're willing to look a little, these concepts have been really worked on. Right? They have been thought, rethought, transformed, and tested in all kinds of ways, like really good technologies. Right? There's actually a ton of literature on most of these concepts, and that makes them very valuable for thinking carefully about what they can do in the world. Now, technology is equally hard to define, and no one should try, but there are some things you can say about it that I think are useful. Um, they're independent of us. We can trade them, gift them, buy them, sell them, rent them. They do things we can't do on our own and sometimes didn't know we needed to do um, and sometimes that we don't want to do. Um, they need to be uh, maintained. They can't survive on their own, right? Um, even the best free software in the world will not survive unless there's, uh, even the best proprietary software in the world will not survive unless there's a community of people maintaining it and making it um, better all the time. Uh, but most importantly, they're made by us. So to a certain extent, concepts share um, these qualities, these qualities of technologies, um, but not all of them and not completely. We tend not to think of ideas like freedom or participation in the same way we do technologies like TCP IP or iPads or fuel cells, right? However, we do tend to talk about technologies that create, enhance, or restrict freedom or privacy or responsibility. And so intuitively, we seem to think that these concepts somehow work themselves into the technologies. The question for me is how? Now I think there's a set of ways in which we generally tend to talk about this, and these are not mutually exclusive, 
um, or exhaustive. But uh, here's just a handful of what I think. One of those is to think about um, concepts kind of like ideological frosting, right? The, the idea that they're not real, they're just concepts. Um, they're not real in the way technologies are. Um, an extreme version of this is show me the code, right? Nothing will, um, uh, nothing else matters, right? As an uh, as a, uh, idealized engineer might say, demonstrate it, prove it can be done. That's one way of thinking about the relationship. Another is that technology is a kind of mystification, that concepts are unconscious ideologies that we carry with us, and they somehow work themselves into the technologies, and failure to accurately understand the concepts leads to bad technologies. Um, all technology is politics, is a standard way of approaching things in um, science studies, science technology studies, which is one of the fields that I come out of, um, often there are ways of, of, of saying um, uh, technologies are um, the, the, the new concepts that have displaced the old ones and politics sort of encodes these, these, these technologies. And then, of course, there's a kind of pessimistic approach too, which is to say that the relationship of con concepts and technologies is as old as humanity. We've always had this problem. Um, writing is an example of a relationship between con concepts and technologies, right? There's some truth to all of these, and, and they're not mutually exclusive, but what they all seem to miss is that um, concepts themselves are malleable, right? Not just technologies. And the more we implement freedom, the more we change it, the more we think what we're doing with our technologies is enhancing or spreading or changing it, the more we actually have an effect on what that concept is what it reveals to us freedom can be and what kinds of freedom it creates in the world, right? So um, I'm just gonna very quickly, because I don't like doing this in such context, very quickly quote, quote one philosopher, and that's Deleuze here, um, who has a very nice way of saying that um, to change a concept would mean to explore it, basically. Um, he says, it's never interesting to criticize a concept in philosophy. It's better to build new functions and discover the new fields which make it useless or inadequate, which is a very, programmer's language way of describing what concepts are, right? That it has something <coughs> built into it, but we haven't figured out what all those functions and fields are, and that that's one of the reasons we might explore this. Now, um, as Femke mentioned, I have tried to think through this a bit, um, and, and, and that notion of the concept helped me think about this um, question of how to describe what it was free software programmers were doing, and came up with this idea of recursive publics, which I won't go into in, in detail here, but the point is that it, um, as a practice, in, in, in the way I described it in the book, has a set of internal components, things like the shareability of software code, legal hacking, the GPL, openness, a definition of openness and how it functions, um, participation, certain kinds of participation or collaboration, specifically things like software versioning, um, et cetera. But there are also a set of external variables that have been changing. So when I did my field work on free software, which was basically 1995 to 2003, it was a different beast than it is today. And that's not because free software itself was different, but because the context, the external things around it were much different. It was the world of the desktop PC and not cloud computing. It was um, the very early days of mobile devices, et cetera. Um, the topology of the internet was much different. Um, the cultural status of remixing was still um, very new and very untested as opposed to now being tested and to some extent um, not having produced quite as much as was predicted 10 years ago. So those external things have changed around free software. And one of the things that I want to do now then is to, is to sort of quickly take you through two concepts that I think have been very important to that history of free software and how they've changed over time, how the concepts have changed over time with implementations, with moments in the history of computing, as it were. So we'll start with freedom, then. Let's start here. And one of the things about freedom is that um, I would try to convince you that we generally talk about um, all kinds of technologies in terms of freedom, but it's actually true that we talk about everything in terms of freedom, which is very frustrating. Here's a screenshot from Google Image Search for all of the uh, things that uh, freedom is associated with, and we associate it with everything, although there's a certain visual consistency to this language. Um, images of upheld arms, liberated birds, broken chains are nearly ubiquitous. Um, when a logo emphasizes a flag, a gun, or an eagle, it's usually conservative or right-wing freedom. When it uses a sans serif font, a color green, or a raised fist. It's usually a left version of freedom, and so on. So we associate it with everything. But it's very clear that we definitely associate it with small and large operations that brand themselves with freedom imagery. So here's two examples of freedom computers. Um, the most obvious case, we'll come back to this, right? This is a 1992 Apple PowerBook ad. 
Um, Microsoft agrees, though they recognize the irony, and so they're much more subtle about it here. Right. Um, there are serious examples of uh, academics and professionals and politicians concerned. Uh, Edward Felton at Princeton's Freedom to Tinker blog, for instance, or the Computer's Freedom and Privacy group. Um, of course, there's the specific concern with freedom of speech on the internet, which is often confused with freedom of the internet itself, and this association between the freedom of the internet has been strongest in the case of net neutrality, um, which um, it, it invokes a, a related set of concepts, especially equality and fairness. And then, of course, there's free software perhaps the most zealously promoted association between freedom and computers in software, and perpetually struggling to disambiguate itself um, as free beer from free speech, right? In English, at least, and I'll come back to that. Um, then, of course, there are things that free software has inspired that have, uh, have, have taken off since then, things like the Freedom Box, uh, Abin Moglen's um, uh, project, um, the Freedom Phone, um, all these technologies that deal with the nexus of freedom, privacy, control, intellectual property. Of course, there's also an interest in freedom from computers, exemplified by this ingenious piece of software called Freedom, of course, um, which just shuts down your access to the internet for however long you actually want to work. Um, they also make software called Antisocial, which shuts off your access to social networks for however long you want to work. It's either the best $10 you'll ever spend or a profound confirmation that there's a sucker born every minute. Right. And then, of course, lately, internet freedom has begun to be associated um, throughout the media um, with the internet generally, um, often in North Africa and the Middle East, um, and freedom as a kind of imperial power or freedom of the internet as statecraft, right? My favorite example of this actually comes from France uh, where there were these wonderful posters for a, um, a, a television show about the um, revolutions in North Africa um, bringing together Twitter, um, the revolutions, and horror in one nice package. So, so all these examples then are meant to pose the question, um, what kind of freedom? Right, organized out. These clearly can't all be the same kinds of freedom. Um, anybody who spent long enough in the free software community will recognize some versions of this as merely jingoistic use of freedom as opposed to an honest approach to the problem of what it is. But it turns out, if you study um, political philosophy or if you're an amateur political philosopher like me, there's a number, a, a very large number of versions of what freedom can mean. And it turns out some of them are actually very useful for trying to narrate the changes that have been happening over the last, I would say, 60 years of computing. Um, and we'll just talk a, a little bit about a few of them since it can mean so many things. Um, Isaiah Berlin once said, the concept is so porous, there is little interpretation it seems able to resist which is a quote I like. But um, perhaps the most obvious um, association for a lot of people is with libertarianism. Here's Ayn Rand. Um, and this uh, is unfortunately a kind of nearly default mode of critique, especially on the left, which is to associate Silicon Valley with liberty, libertarianism, and especially to associate libertarianism with Ayn Rand. Um, this is not unreasonable. <laughs> there is definitely some truth to this, especially in Silicon Valley. Um, but it's actually not really correct, and it's certainly not correct of free software. Um, so uh, one might then turn to some classic definitions. Um, most everyone's been forced to read it in, in philosophy or pretend to read at some point. Um, Isaiah Berlin's famous short article, Two Concepts of Liberty, in which he rehearsed for a new generation, um, this sort of epic struggle between what's known as negative liberty and positive liberty. Um, negative liberty, which is often wrongly associated with libertarianism, is about the zone of coercion, individual coercion, right? Are you being coerced or prevented from doing something um, where liberty is narrowly defined as the absence of, of, of liberty? I'm free only insofar as I'm not directly restrained or coerced. Um, and, and Berlin says, um, the answer to the question, who governs me, is logically distinct from the question, how far does government interfere with me? He's very interested in the nature of coercion or interference in proposing the idea of negative liberty, and it's a very important concept for anyone in political philosophy. Its opposite, positive liberty, is, um, in Berlin especially, associated with the tradition that sees liberty that's something that the individual must attain, right? Not freedom from, but freedom to freedom to do something, enabling yourself to be able to do something. Um, and it might be surprising that Berlin suggests 
that positive liberty is no better than a specious disguise for brutal tyranny. <laughs> Why does he not like positive liberty? Uh, well, what makes positive liberty dangerous is not its visions of autonomy or self-actualization per se, but the attempt by any organization or state to impose this particular form of freedom on others. Um, it's evil by most definitions of freedom to restrict freedom in the name of freedom. Right? You can't do that. So this is one definition of freedom. And I actually think it's kind of interesting that this tension between positive and negative liberty is something we can see clearly in certain key moments in the liberation of computing from the 1960s forward. So for instance, if you've read Fred Turner's book or Thomas Streeter's book on the history of computing, both excellent books on this history that I recommend, um, the computer was once identified with bureaucratic, centralized, and standardized corporations. Computers exemplified instrumental reason and the separation of means and ends. They were associated with organization man, with the military-industrial complex, with the closed world of destructive military power in Vietnam and the Cold War. They were emblems for protesters in the 1960s who wore punch cards around their necks. Um, here's Organization Man by William White with a punch card on its cover. I'm not a human being, do not fold, spindle, or mutilate, right? Um, and, and this approach to understanding computers as bureaucratic and repressive was shared just as much by people in the industry as people outside of the industry, right? Um, there were those who um, saw the kind of mainframe culture of the mid-1960s as the problem that needed to be rebelled against. And um, Thomas Streeter and Fred Turner, in both of their books, single out a series of people who are responsible for this transformation, and one of the most famous of them, who I've already mentioned, is J.C.R. Licklitter. Here he is down there on the bottom. Um, uh, and, and he was an early program director at ARPA, uh, responsible for the first version of, the first, let's say, pro prototype idea of the internet, which he called the galactic net. Um, and his vision of what computers can achieve was quite radical by the expectations of the day. He had unparalleled interactive interaction with a computer, which very few people at the, t at the time had, right? And could experience that interactivity as something which was freeing, right? Which allowed him to think thoughts that he could not think before. And he wanted to bring that power to other people. He wanted other people to experience this sense of being able to really literally sit in front of a computer, tell it to do something, have it do that, and then tell it to do something else, right? Rather than having to wait or, or be prevented by a hierarchy or a bureaucracy that controlled access to these machines. Um, this version of uh, um, interactive computing was brought to fruition um, in a very famous case by Douglas Engelbart in the online system in 1968 in a famous demonstration between his headquarters at the Stanford Research Institute and an auditorium in San Francisco and included all of the elements that we were now familiar, familiar with in computing, um, the mouse, word processing, um, file structures, cut and paste, and many other things that are easily recognizable, but only in hindsight. And Engelbart, much more than Licklitter, saw the goal of a more personal computer in terms of positive liberty, uh, which literally augmented human intelligence, um, allowing them to achieve things they could not before. Um, this version of positive liberty, the freedom to think, to do more than humans could by themselves, was clearly present in the work of people like Seymour Papert and Alan Kay as well, both of whom clearly associated personal freedom with education and childhood and a desire to bring computers to them, to make it possible for all humans to augment their intelligence and their freedom. Uh, and here is where there might be an objection, whether they wanted to or not, right? So the question being, how do positive and negative freedom play together in this mm, uh, enabling of, of liberty. But the most e famous example of this association has surely got to be Ted Nelson's Computer Lib slash Dream Machines um, booklet from 1974, explicitly modeled on the whole Earth catalog and bearing the exhortation, you can and must learn computers now. The book surveyed the whole computer culture of 1974, including legal, copyright, and other issues, introduced the idea of hypertext writing, and explained in a distinctive countercultural style all kinds of engineering and computer science lingo and ideas, liberally sprinkled with illustrations from R. Crumb and the Wizard of Oz books, which were out of copyright. So. Now, um, the enemy in this parable of the personal computer was often um, the very large corporation like IBM and later AT&T. Here's a famous image of AT&T as the Death Star, for instance. But there were always others like DEC or PDP, for instance, 
makers of mini computers, who represented a resistance from within, right? The people who were going to bring freedom, bring liberation to the world of computing from within the computing industry. Um, and more generally, I would say, the enemy was, was not the large corporation, but it was the technological innovation system itself, right? Um, Nelson's book, for instance, Ted Nelson's book, is replete with anxiety that the course of innovation as it exists will restrict rather than enhance freedom. Um, and he's tell constantly telling people to do things differently. Engelbart had a notion of a different way of, of designing, which he called bootstrapping. Um, which would lead us out of this wrong form of engineering, this wrong, wrong form of te technological engineering associated with people like IBM or AT&T. Um, and, and eventually, this would um, allow us to create art and beauty with a computer, as Stephen Levy would put it in his book on hackers later. And of course, if this sounds like Steve Jobs, it should, because the purest example of this surely has to be the 1984 um, commercial for the Apple Macintosh. Um, and they were the first company, really, Apple was the first company to make good on this particular promise of positive freedom, to offer to restrict users' freedoms in the name of freedom, right? To offer convenience, ease of use, simplicity as a route towards the dream of computer lib imagined by Alan Kay, Seymour Papert, and Ted Nelson, and to explicitly give it to everyone, right? A kind of populist corporate paternalism a war for freedom fought against endlessly renewed enemies like engineers and bureaucrats and bean counters and against the forces, especially in Steve Jobs' case, of ugliness. Right. Now, I think this is a totally fascinating way of thinking about what Apple achieved because they were obviously very successful. <laughs> My apologies. Um, and it is um, one of the ways we can think about how making careful distinctions between positive and negative freedom can help us rethink what this concept has brought us and what it might bring us in the future, right? But this way is um, only one way of thinking about freedom. There are others that um, are not so focused, for instance, on the role of the individual or of individual choice. Um, debates about collective freedom, for instance, um, have focused on things like the time-shared operating system, which emerged right around the same time as um, this famous book of political philosophy, which also dealt with problems of, um, uh, of uh, um, equality and fairness. Um, and freedom here in this context is less positive or negative than a question of how to uh, configure a collective resource, how to design a system that would equitably allow everyone a chance at freedom without harming others. Um, and this, of course, expresses itself through the idea of time sharing, um, which was perceived as a freedom promising innovation from batch processing. Um, and would bring computing to everyone. Eventually, it would bring computing to everyone it was dreamed of in the 1960s as a computer utility, which is a dream that has come back, I would say, about once every five years since 1965 or so, and is currently with us in the form of cloud computing. Um, a remarkably similar problem of freedom was at the heart of the ARPANET's design, and in particular, the design of the TCP IP protocols that still structure um, most of the internet. Um, and that this was a, a way to solve the problem of administratively bounded networks, to allow different networks to share resources without interfering with one another. Explicitly figured here by David Clark in one of the um, famous sort of reflections on the design philosophy of, Dar of the DARPA internet protocols um, as, a, as a problem of, of, of freedom. Um, similarly, the Unix operating system implemented freedom as a timeshared operating system as a portable one, as one that could be trans transferred from um, place to place, and as ultimately a philosophy of how to do things that would implement um, a particular understanding of freedom. There's also another tradition of freedom in our culture, however, and one that periodically re reappears and goes by the name of Republican or Civic Republican freedom. And this tradition is associated with Machiavelli, Rousseau, de Tocqueville, the founders of the United States, etc has a strong tradition here in Spain. Um, and this, in, in freedom in Republican is freedom from domination. And there's a particular kind of paradox that civic Republicans love, which is the paradox of the contented slave. Um, Republicans, for the most part, reject any attempt at positive liberty, just as partisans of negative liberty do, but they also reject negative liberty because it leads to the possibility that one could be a slave with a particularly benevolent master. Right? One who never actually interferes with the slave, but who doesn't actually give the slave his freedom. So the idea of a contented slave, a slave who is always subject to the arbitrary whim of the master, is one that most people find to be a simple contradiction. 
And it's this notion of freedom that I think is at the heart of what people in the IT industry mean when they talk about vendor lock-in, for instance, right? Or proprietary lock-in, or switching costs, or the problems of antitrust and monopoly. This is the idea that, well, yes, uh, IBM and then um, Microsoft and then Apple and then Google may not actually interfere with my freedom, may not really actually be doing it right now, but they have the arbitrary power to do so. And that is freedom as non-domination. Um, there they are. I'm not going to say anything about that. Um, this is obviously something which um, uh, we have associated in the free software community with the advantages of free software, right? That leads out of lock-in. And, and again, is associated with this problem with cloud computing, um, which um, we might say the same of today is about problems of civic republican liberty, especially as we learn more about its insecurity, its tendency towards monopoly, and ultimately towards um, lock-in. Um, one might also reflect a little bit about this problem, which we come back to over and over again, of the difference between free and free in English, um, libra and gratis, um, the nice distinction that everybody else in the world gets to draw, but those of us who speak English do not. Um, but I think it's actually important because there's a good reason for this confusion in English, in American English, I would say, and that's because to pay for something is to assert autonomy and anonymity. It bears the marks of a certain understanding of freedom. But to be given something is to submit to an obligation, um, often to be saved by someone else's generosity. Um, free, so for, free software often offers to save people, and some people don't want to be saved, especially if they're not told about it. Um, so that's freedom. How much time do I have left? Five more minutes? Okay, well, the, I, I'll go quickly through participation because it's, um, uh, there's less to say about it in some ways, uh, and it's less well understood. But um, I, I'd like to differentiate it actually from a number of other terms which are much more often used in this concept of, of collaboration and cooperation and altruism. We heard a bit about that last night. Um, and it's obvious that participation is central to all kinds of things that have been happening over the last decade, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, peer production, user-generated content, etc. What I think makes participation interestingly different from this is that participation is supposed to bring benefits to the person who participates, right? It's got a loop in it, right? You don't just participate and make something better, you benefit from that. We don't know exactly how, we don't know exactly what, but that's what participation means here. Collaboration can happen without you necessarily benefiting from it. Cooperation can happen without you benefiting. In fact, you can lose by cooperating. That's one of the puzzles that evolutionary um, biologists love. Um, uh, yes, am I, am I torturing the translators? My apologies. They've been working very hard and they're, they deserve a break, so. I won't speak too quickly. Um, participation also has its own visual language. It usually involves raising your hands, right, um, in whatever context. Um, here's the pirate party voting, right, or in this case, laughing, which I like. Um, participation uh, is a creature of the 20th century. I don't know if you can quite see this. This is a Google n-gram graph of, um, in red is representation, in green is democracy, and in blue is participation. So you can see participation exploding over the course of the 20th century as a concept, um, which is in Google's digitized books. So take that with a grain of salt, but just as a way of demonstrating this. Um, similarly, versus collaboration, it's much more common. Um, and the, the adjective participatory is interesting because it didn't really exist before May of 1962, and I'll explain why. But participation has a lot of different histories to it. Um, uh, for um, my Portuguese listeners, I think of these as heteronyms after Fernando Pessoa. Um, very different categories of what participation means um, that are kind of non-overlapping but seem to deal with the same conceptual problem. So participation in, in, in labor, worker participation, participation, participatory design, participatory culture, um, methexis and participation in philosophy, right? There are sort of these interesting points of overlap. So um, worker participation is an obvious um, uh, history, comes in a rainbow of colors. This is a very happy version of worker participation right here. Um, Spain has its own uh, sort of um, much, much heralded version of worker participation in the Mondragon collectives. Um, this has a, 
robust tradition uh, that goes back uh, into the history of socialism and unionism under the label of industrial democracy, um, which was a very, actually very active and very robust community of people thinking about participation in America from about the late 19th century until 1962, which also spawned um, as one version of it, what we know of as participatory design in Scandinavia. Um, here's Kristen Nygaard, the inventor of Simula, who was also involved in participatory, participatory design as one exemplar of that. Um, and then, of course, in 1962, um, uh, the creation of the Students for Democratic Society and the Port Huron Statement, which declared this label participatory democracy for the first time and declared it as a goal for the student movement at that time. Uh, the student, the SDS was in fact the um, Oedipal successor to the League for Industrial Democracy, right? It was a way of killing that, got it. And of course, 50 years later, the connections are very clearly made to the Occupy movement. Um, and here you see the hands again, the visual language of participation always involves hands, right? Um, here's a local example. Um, I won't talk about the work we're doing, which is looking at ca sort of case-based analysis of participation, um, where we're trying to figure out ways to visualize um, questions we have about participation. Maybe I'll do a lightning talk on it tomorrow. Um, but one of the things we do ask about it is the question of normative theories of participation, and that is, um, what makes participation work, and how do you break it down? Does it have an educative dividend? Do people get some kind of education out of participating? Does it benefit the participant? Do people get to participate in goals as well as tasks in any given project? Do participants maintain control or ownership over the resources that are created, a la the GPL, right? Um, is there the capacity for exit without harm or penalty? Most of the answers to these questions are yes in free software, right? But no in a lot of other cases that get called participation in contemporary culture. Um, does it have metrics? Does it allow for communication? And this has implications for what the word participation means. So it often uh, forces us towards talking about things like liking instead of voting, or deliberating versus interacting, or protesting versus giving feedback or giving some sort of comment. Right. So let's come back then to our friend, the parasite and return to this question of what it is that parasites can help us learn about this. And let me remind you then that I had these three ways of thinking through parasites. And I actually think the last two of these are related. Um, and, and it's important, I think, to, to, to try and understand how they are related. Um, we live with an opposition between free software and proprietary software because we're relying on a narrow understanding of freedom and participation, I think. We think of it as the, as I would say in parasite language, the free living stage of the cycle of free software. For over a decade, free software appeared to have broken free from its hosts and wanted an environment all its own. Right? Rather than living in shit, it wanted to float free in the air or on the water. All this talk of using this application or that application or this operating system or that operating system instead of that one um, in order to enhance freedom was right for one stage of the life cycle, I would submit. But it might be wrong for the stage that we're entering into. Instead, we're back inside the rat, as it were. The cloud computing, proprietary IP madness of the crazed Silicon Valley rat. <laughs> and it's time, maybe, to infect its brain again, to find new ways to manipulate its behavior and to become again a free-living entity if only for a time. Now I would say that we've seen this cycle before. We've been through several stages at which freedom and participation have redefined the technology that we use and in turn been redefined. Um, so for instance in the 1970s the personal computer freed us from the mainframe but what we got in response was proprietary operating systems and incompatible devices and formats. But in 1980s, Unix and open networks offered to free us um, to connect and experiment. But what did we get instead in the, let's say, second stage of the life cycle? Incompatible versions of Unix. But in the free living version, free software frees us from Unix, right? And we have a legal revolution. I think this cycle actually repeats. 
I used to think that we were on our way towards a world in which free software would be spread everywhere. But I actually now think that the cycle just continues to repeat. And I think it's incredibly important for every generation of people who are involved in it to understand that there's always more of this kind of work to be done, to figure out how freedom and participation can be brought to bear on problems that are not specific to free software, but specific to all of the environments in which we live and work, right? That too much focus on free software as an internal community in which people communicate with each other means not enough focus on how free software infects and manipulates the behavior of external hosts, like Silicon Valley, for instance. And we could say the same thing of participation, but um, I won't go through that here because I think maybe we'll have some questions. So I'll just say, Thank you to everyone, including the translators who are not listening. Here. Maybe you'd like, maybe you'd like a, a mic like this so you can move a bit. Sure, sure. Let's do. I, does it look like I want to get up and move around? <laughs> well, I can, I can, I can, I can play f as we fill Donahue here and go out into the audience. Are there any questions from the audience? Questions? Oh, competing microphones. You may ask anything. <laughs> yes. Come in, come in. Um, I really like the font you were using in the talk. <laughs> <laughs> How, what's it called? <laughs> it's not an open source font. I wish it was. <laughs> It's called graphic. <laughs> I'm intending to make an open source version of it because I learned all kinds of things about FontForge today. So, <laughs> so Brennan. Okay, so um, I've been reading a lot of Friedrich Kittler lately <laughs> and he's, I mean, some people don't like his ideas, but um, it, it made me start thinking about the fact that if we accept the use or the or particular technology gets used and really widespread, how much of um, how much of the realm of possibility of freedom is dictated by that system itself? So, so I yeah, guess I, I think I'm asserting something fairly similar there, and I just don't think that it's um, restricted to the question of free versus proprietary, right? That there are ways in which technologies that we have to rely on spread all around us and change the configuration of possibilities for freedom. But we also have the ability to explore what freedom is and how it can be brought to bear on these new technologies, right? So cloud computing is a very concrete example here, right? The GPL doesn't really work for cloud computing because it's not a desktop PC. It's not really of interest to most people to install a version of Gmail on their own machine. Right? So how do we infect uh, cloud computing practice with the same principles of free software without having to rely on the principles that we developed in the era of the desktop PC, right? of the individualized personal computer? Right? Does that make sense? I don't know the answer. I'm asking the question. <laughs> Maybe just a slight remark. Um, I'm not sure if cloud computing is the right uh, target here. It's more like the, the thing that the, the personal computer enabled, like managing your own information is, uh, what is changing right now is that a lot of your personal information is managed by someone else. Like what is your social status, in what, are, in what groups are you, basically which social network are you in? And, um, so I'm not sure if that's the same as cloud computing. So maybe more a little bit technical nitpick, but... No, yeah. I, would, I, would, I, would, I would agree with you. I think they're, they're two different things, so th but they're connected, right? And actually cloud computing is a good example because there's a tremendous amount of open source activity around, for instance, the hypervisor level, right? And so one can say, well, free software open source is alive and well within, computing, within cloud computing, but we have this other problem which is private information and, pi and privacy uh, and the control of those resources. Now, whether or not we can solve that problem in the same way that we tried to solve it with free software is, I think, an open question. Okay, uh, that's not two questions, but two remarks. Uh, first, we 
I think uh, building a free internet, we, we build a jungle, so bigger predators uh, okay. instead. Yes. And um, the best uh, technology we have to fight Gmail or other cloud computing application is uh, things like Adblock or it's a, I, I don't want to be a client of your system. And that's a working technology, actually. <laughs> I would add to that diversity, right? If you want to understand how a healthy biological life cycle works and how evolution functions, diversity is the central concept to how that works. So the world we're creating right now, the world, well, let's say the world Silicon Valley is creating right now is one that's concentrating and monopolizing and reducing diversity. And it does this, I think, cyclically, right? So the question is, how do you fight back to produce more diversity in the information technology ecology that we all live in, right? And I think free software contributes to that. I think open source contributes to that. But there may also be way, other ways of, 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 of increasing that diversity. Hola. Eh, bueno, creo que al final has dado una pincelada de lo que te voy a preguntar, pero me gustaría que fueras como, bueno, que te mojaras. Eh, mi duda o, tu, o mi pregunta es una controversia sobre el concepto de libertad y participación en cuanto al software libre y a lo que es la cultura libre. Eh, en el momento en el que el software es libre, nos permite descargarnos de una forma gratuita o, o, o tener acceso a una información que antes estaba restringida bajo previo pago. Pero mi duda es si el hecho de tener esa información permite una participación no solo desde la propia disciplina de la cual eh, eh, digamos, puede participar eh, ese colectivo, sino desde otras. Es decir, esta plataforma, por ejemplo, el Media Lab, eh, con este, este encuentro, eh, selecciona no solo a diseñadores, sino a otro tipo de perfiles para participar en ella. Sin embargo, por ejemplo, las, las exposiciones, eh, aun siendo libre, eh, son con un lenguaje muy concreto, es decir, que si no perteneces a su disciplina no te enteras. Me gustaría saber cuál es tu opinión acerca de ese, eh, eh, del concepto de cultura libre, o sea, si realmente es libre, accesible la cultura. Gracias. That's a um, fantastic question. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to figure out with participation is the difference between participation within group, so those who do actually understand the language, for instance, and um, general, universal participation, right? Um, and uh, I, I tend more and more not to believe that the latter actually exists. So it becomes a question of scale and modularity, basically patterns of participation. Um, and this is something that actually Carol Pateman, who wrote one of the famous works on participatory democracy, described as patterns of participation in society. So if you have good forms of participation in the home and in the workplace and in the art gallery and in the cafe, that those patterns build on each other to produce better patterns of participation at the political level and that that's the kind of thing that people should be working on to enhance participation. So I think people who actually participate in free culture of the sort that involves participation, not just downloading, and I include piracy here at, piracy here at some level. There, there is participation in piracy. Um, but those who participate in that, I think, learn good forms of participation. Those who participate in say, crowdfunding, or not crowdfunding, crowdsourcing a la Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, may not be learning good forms of participation. And the more of those patterns we have, 
the worse our political system looks, I think. Okay. Good? No? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I take one more question because I think we can speak uh, for the rest of the night. Uh, I think over there, well, okay, two. Uh, because we would like to see the processing documentary uh, that's made here in Madrid, and we'll screen it here uh, in this um, auditorium tonight. So, I take one, two. Um, so, you describe this historical dynamic that we have between these opposing ideas. And you describe them largely in terms of different opposing forces, um, in some sense, transforming each other, I suppose. I, I suppose what I'm wondering is whether there's um, a, um, something present within those forces which is predefining the next, the next iteration, so to speak. And I guess I'm kind of thinking about that in a kind of Marxist frame, so do, do, does the current definition of propriety software itself hold within it the next definition of freedom, for example? You know, um, I'm, I tend to be agnostic on such theories. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, if it's true that that kind of development happens, that kind of development of let's call it a, a technological determinism or a conceptual determinism that one stage determines what's, what the next one is. I think it's local. I think it's fundamentally local. That it's not something that is autonomous and unfolds with um, uncaring certainty, right? Um, and one of the ways I think about this is the function of maintenance in our culture, um, which is undervalued and underappreciated generally and hidden for the most part, but is absolutely essential to whatever it is, the tech, whatever technologies it, it, it is we actually use on a day-to-day -day basis, right? We would not be able to do any of these things if there weren't a tremendous amount of human activity going into maintaining them. And um, if that stops, then it's not that the technology held within it some, the seeds of its own destruction, it's that we've stopped maintaining it, right? Who knows why those choices were made, but if they're made, then we end up ceasing that maintenance. And I think understanding that that human component of it, this is about as Marxist as I get, <laughs> understanding the centrality of that human component to the maintenance of technologies is I think really important to understanding whether or not they can produce freedom for us or more kinds of freedom for us. Hi, sorry. That's the last question. Okay. <laughs> well, wonderful uh, lecture. It then, you know, which was this sort of most in, and in software culture as a representative startup culture. Uh, I, I was interested that you wanted somehow to problematize it a little bit uh, because it's sort of become attacking one specific uh, strand of ideology in Silicon Valley as rand uh, libertarianism. And this is also like a bit of a revival also in, obviously in the uh, leftist political analysis of things like the so-called sharing economy and the, and, the, and, the, and the kind of activity that is appearing around it. So I, I was curious if you could expand a little bit your idea about what is the actual weight of this specific strand of political thought if we analyze Silicon Valley and also if we can actually reduce it to something like that because I suspect it's way more unstable and abstract and as an entity to, to, to understand politically. Uh, are you talking about reducing it to Silicon Valley and startup culture? Is that what you said? I mean that Silicon Valley and startup culture uh, would be more problematic to define as something that coming basically from the Rand libertarian yeah, yeah. Uh, strand of ideology, and, and that's about it. I, I think if you go to Silicon Valley, you'll discover worlds and worlds of difference, right? The, the place itself contains multitudes, right? What's wrong with Silicon Valley is its media presentation, right? And this is um, uh, facilitated by and enhanced by journalists 
who um, are always on the lookout for the pundits who will tell us what's going to come next from Silicon Valley. That's the problem with Silicon, but not Silicon Valley itself per se, which has all kinds of people in it. And one of the ways I give this talk about freedom is to say, associating libertarianism with Silicon Valley is unfair to the other 90% of people who are not libertarian, right? There are conservatives and there are um, Democrats and there are people who don't care at all about politics and et cetera, et cetera, in Silicon Valley. So the question is why does the media and why does the discourse around it um, automatically come back to this punditry? And that, especially in America, is a problem that we have with lots of, of, of areas of our culture. Um, but it's particularly pronounced with Silicon Valley. We don't get it with media startups in New York. We don't get it with European media startups. We don't get it, you know, we only get it with Silicon Valley for the most part. So that was the last, last question. Yes. Although, if you want to have a parasite meal, right, <laughs> then you can ask me questions later. Chris will be around. You can sit at my table. Thank you very much. <laughs>